Thanks for inviting me to speak today. This is actually about case studies of rheumatic heart disease in pregnant women. And I'm going to go through four cases just to illustrate the range of presentation of rheumatic heart disease in pregnancy. Rheumatic heart disease is a rare condition but is distributed unevenly over Australia because of inequities to healthcare access. When we look at rheumatic heart disease writing group data, 3.2% of Aboriginal people in Northern Territory in the 35 to 44 year age group have rheumatic heart disease and three quarters of 225 women who underwent valve replacement surgery according to an Auckland database were Maori or Pacific Islander women with rheumatic heart disease. Acute rheumatic fever is even rarer um, for us in Sydney and this is an immune response to group A strep infection usually three weeks after infection characterized by a number of major manifestations including carditis but other manifestations like skin changes as well as minor criteria including elevated inflammatory markers and a prolonged PR interval on ECG. We know that pregnancy is associated with increased cardiac work with the cardiac output increasing 50% and that this leads to an increased risk of decompensation with a whole range of heart disease including congenital but also rheumatic heart disease. And mitral stenosis is particularly poorly tolerated and this is because as cardiac output increases there's an increase in pressure gradient and as heart rate increases, particularly towards the end of pregnancy, there's a redu reduction in diastolic filling time and worsening of mitral stenosis. There are a number of ways we try to quantify the risk for these women during pregnancy. And a CARPREG score is one of these, which works better in rheumatic heart disease and valvular heart disease. And it looks at New York Heart Association class, whether there's a previous cardiac event, left heart obstruction defined as a mitral valve or a a, a mitral valve area of less than 2 and aortic valve less than 1.5 and left ventricular dysfunction. There's an interesting study from Sartain investigators in, from Cairns Base Hospital from 1999 to 2010 and there were 95 confinements in women with rheumatic heart disease and what was notable was that in fact there were no maternal or neonatal deaths but there's the potential for a lot of morbidity when they used a modified CARPREG score, which was an aortic or mitral valve area of less than 1.5 square centimetres and adding in primary pressure as a risk factor, in the women who had no risk factors, the cardiac complications were zero. But as soon as there was one or more risk factor, the risk of a cardiac event during that pregnancy increased from 29 to 50%. So I'll go through. The, the first case is, um, is a woman from Pakistan who was 30 and in her first pregnancy at 32 weeks and she was transferred from another hospital with left heart failure and had mitral stenosis and she was brought across for Brian Bailey to assess for suitability for mitral valvular plasty and Brian will in the next session show how, this is, how the procedure is actually performed. But this is to show you a typical rheumatic mitral valve with thickening of the leaflets and the hockey stick deformity and we look at a number of factors to assess suitability for valvular plasty, including leaflet mobility, leaflet thickening, subvalvular thickening, so how far down the caudal apparatus the thickening extends, and calcification. And Brian always tells us to add in other measurements as well, so assessment of commissural calcification in terms of suitability, and how much mitral regurgitation there is to start, because severe mitral regurgitation is one of the complications of this procedure and moderate plus mitral regurgitation would be an exclusion. And of course we want to be sure that there's no thrombus because the left atrium is going to be instrumented. So in this particular patient she had a mitral valve area of 0.9. She had a resting mean gradient at 32 weeks of 34 millimeter mercury. You can see in the, in the four chamber the inflow acceleration and little mitral regurgitation. And she was assessed as a suitable candidate. You can see there's some calcification but not very heavy calcification. And so Brian went on to do the valvular plasty and um, the mean gradient introduced from 34 to 16 with a valve area increased from 0.9 to 1.6 square centimetres. So she went on to um, a successful continuation of that pregnancy. And this fits with, with an Indian study 2016 of 49 cases, 48 were successful. The one that wasn't was because of a failed transeptal puncture and only one ended up with severe mitral regurgitation, but most went on to deliver close to term. 
So she did well, she was happy, and she went home, and three years later she came back in her second pregnancy. And at 28 weeks she has um, restenosis of a mitral valve, which is one of the problems with rheumatic mitral valve disease. And the question was, was she, should she have any intervention at this stage? So she's got a mitral valve area now of 1.1. She does have some pulmonary hypertension, but her mitral mean gradient is 14 millimeter mercury. And if you remember back, it was 36 prior to her first valvular plasty. If you just used a modified Cartwright score, she would score highly because she has a mitral valve area below the cutoff and she has pulmonary hypertension. But in fact, she was managed medically during this pregnancy and she had a good outcome. So the medical management is predominantly beta blockers, the beta-1 selective blockers, and particularly metoprolol. Um, you may need other measures as well, which um, she did not require, but restricting physical activity. If the women are in atrial fibrillation, to use anticoagulation, treat heart failure with diuretics as you need. But it's much better to assess the women before pregnancy, and if the mitral valve area is less than 1.5 square centimeters at that time, to decide prior to pregnancy um, whether to go on to an intervention. Second case is a 22-year-old who's unusual in that she's Australian, non-Aboriginal, from Newcastle. She's already had a pregnancy, which was uncomplicated, except that she had hypertension towards the end of that pregnancy. But now, in her second pregnancy, she didn't have any antenatal care until 30 weeks, when she was seen only by midwives, until she developed acutely unwell at 36 weeks in pregnancy. And she was transferred down to Royal Prince Alfred after some diuresis, and even at the stage, she looked pretty bad with an elevated JVP, persistent sinus tachycardia, pansystolic and mid-diastolic murmurs, and features of right heart failure, pedal edema, hepatomegaly. Her other history is of recurrent tonsillitis, sometimes treated with antibiotics, and anemia, which was only picked up at her 30-week first booking visit. And on testing, she had an elevated, she had a minimally elevated CRP and ESR, which is actually normal for pregnancy, and a hemoglobin of 90. And this was her echo. So, not, so she does have thickening of her mitral leaflets and thickening of the subvalvular apparatus, and she does have a smallish valve area, but not an absolutely typical rheumatic deformity, although it is probably what it is. And she's got really severe mitral regurgitation. And you can see the coaptation defect because of all of the thickening um, in the long axis view. And so severe regurgitation, an ERO of 0.6, a mitral valve area that's small but not critically so, and a mitral mean gradient of 12, which is partly related to the increased forward flow across the mitral valve. And she does also have right heart dilatation and impaired function, and with it, pulmonary hypertension, and you saw the septal abnormality of motion in the, in the short axis view as well. And she's got pulmonary pressures with an RVRA gradient of 59 millimeter mercury. So, does she have established rheumatic heart disease, which is what we decided finally, or, or did she have acute rheumatic fever? So, besides carditis, she had no other manifestations of acute rheumatic fever. She didn't have elevated inflammatory markers, and she didn't have a recent streptococcal infection. Should she have been treated more aggressively for her previous tonsillitis? In fact, she didn't fit into the guidelines requiring that because a strep infection is more likely with a high fever, tender cervical nodes, an exudate, um, and a systemic illness. But antibiotic therapy is really only recommended for those patients who are under 25 in communities which have a high incidence of rheumatic fever or in those who've got pre-existing rheumatic heart disease. And now that we think she does have rheumatic heart disease, however, she should go on to prevention of medication to prevent recurrent rheumatic fever, and that is either benzathine, penicillin, IM, three to four weekly, or phenoxymethyl, PEN-V, twice daily, for a long time. So either 10 years after the first episode, 35 years if she's got moderate rheumatic heart disease, or in this particular person, until 40 with her severe rheumatic heart disease, which will probably require surgery. So, treat, so what did we do for her? Treated heart failure with diuretics, but really didn't win, because she had persisting signs of failure, and she went on to have steroid cover, caesarean section, which was a challenge because she had a combined spal spinal epidural with a skilled cardiac anesthetist with difficulty lying her flat even for the spinal. Uh, she improved quite quickly in the first 24 hours in terms of right ventricular function and pulmonary pressures, but really had persisting severe mitral regurgitation. And so she is going to require a surgical approach to her valve probably relatively soon. 
the other important point is that she should be encouraged to enroll in the rheumatic heart disease registry because this ensures that rheumatic fever prophylaxis is carried on when these women go back to their communities and she has already left Sydney. Okay. Third case is from Nepal, a 31-year-old, and I saw her at eight weeks in her first pregnancy. Now, she had already had a mitral valve repair because of rheumatic, predominantly mitral regurgitation by Profilelli, and this was in preparation for a future pregnancy. So she had a commissurotomy, neocordy, and an aninoplasty ring. And so she was asymptomatic, working full-time as a nurse, and when I saw her at eight weeks, she had um, systolic and mid-diastolic murmurs. And on echo, she had a mitral valve area of two and a mean mitral gradient early pregnancy at rest of 10 millimeters mercury and an um, RVRA pressure gradient of 28. Now, in these women, it's quite useful to go on to exercise echo to assess what the exercise tolerance is and to see what happens to pulmonary pressures because this does predict how they will go during a pregnancy. And she got to almost normal predicted workload. And with that, her RVRA gradient went up to 38, which was regarded as acceptable. And this was similar to what happened to her as she went on through the pregnancy. So she had a mitral, uh, this is her mitral valve area of two. You can see the aneuploasty ring, the um, neocordy. She's got some limit, mild mitral regurgitation only. And her mean gradient went up to about 14 during pregnancy and her RVRA pressure gradient up to 34. But this was in the setting of a beta blocker. So she, and when you, the beta blocker was commenced, she felt better and her gradient came down almost immediately related to the um, increased diastolic feeding time with a slower rate. Um, so she actually went on to a normal delivery and you just need to be aware of, of a number of things. So a low threshold for epidural, potentially limit the second stage and avoid excess volume. And with induction of labour, with syntocin, and these women can get quite large volumes of fluid, so 100 or 200 mils an hour, and you might need to change the concentration that you're giving. And she did need diuretics for the first three days post-delivery because she did have some evidence of fluid overload at that time. And you need to be careful during pregnancy with diuretics, but also afterwards, because if you have too much Lasix, then there's impairment of establishment of lactation as well. Okay. And the last case is the most complex case. A 33-year-old lady who's also from overseas, from India. She had rheumatic fever, and she went on to have both aortic and mitral valve replacements at 18 with a smallish aortic valve, a 19 millimeter omniscience. This is the omniscience valve here. And her post-op echo in India showed a, a satisfactory mitral mean gradient, but her aortic valve mean gradient had always been elevated at 34 millimeter mercury from her early post-op echo. When I saw her, she'd arrived shortly before in Australia. She didn't have a GP. She was taking warfarin as per her regimen in India, which was alternating two and three milligrams with no INR monitoring at all. Her work was sedentary for optus. She could manage a flight of stairs before, falling, before becoming short of breath. And she was six weeks pregnant with a much wanted baby. Her blood pressure, she had a small pulse pressure, a reduced volume carotid pulse, uh, pressure overload at apex, and soft aortic prosthetic sounds, and a murmur of aortic stenosis. And she had marked left ventricular hypertrophy, which actually measured 19 or 20 millimetres, and she had flow acceleration through her mitral prosthesis and particularly through her aortic prosthesis. And her aortic mean prosthetic gradient was 71 millimetre mercury, and she, had, um, and she had pulmonary hypertension as well. And this was fluoroscopy, probably performed by Brian, which uh, this shows the aortic prosthesis, you can see the disc here, and it's opening to 60 degrees, it should open to 120 degrees for this particular valve. So after discussion with her and her husband, she went on to termination of pregnancy and cardiac surgery where her valve was replaced with a larger onyx 21 millimeter valve and there was panis that was noted and severe obstruction of this prosthetic valve. She did much better, improved exercise tolerance, regression of left ventricular hypertrophy, but then she came back to discuss a future pregnancy. And this raises the issues of these pregnancies, which are high risk, and in large part because of the problems with anticoagulation. So for her, she's safest having 
warfarin, and if she uses heparin, there's a three times greater risk of serious thrombobilic complications, obviously impact on the fetus as well. But the fetal risk is three times higher with warfarin, and that's not just the teratogenicity of the first trimester, which is probably dose-dependent, but there's an increased fetal loss that persists throughout pregnancy. And she decided um, on, on a fairly commonly used option, which was clexane in the first trimester to avoid the teratogenicity, warfarin mid-pregnancy, and she needed a bigger dose, a seven milligrams, and aspirin added in in the second and third trimester. And she had some of the not uncommon pregnancy complications, so essential hypertension, gestational diabetes, and did well with all of this until 35 weeks when she presented acutely unwell in the setting of new onset atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response and heart failure, and also coincidentally preeclampsia as well. And so she was stabilized um, in ICU over 24 hours with heart failure treatment, control of her rate, and steroid cover for the baby, and then she went on to have caesarean delivery. And so with caesarean delivery, you stop the IV heparin for four hours before and then recommence it four to six hours post-delivery without a bolus at the lowest, uh, at the lowest um, low, low therapeutic range. And despite this, she had bleeding, and this is common. And if you look at the ROPAC studies from overseas, about 20% of people will have hemorrhagic complications. And she had... Um, intra-abdominal bleeding that, that needed a lot of intervention, so draining of the hematoma, bilateral internal epigastric artery embolization, and transfusion. But she got through all of that. She had a DC reversion, and she's remained in sinus rhythm since, and has been well, and her son is well as well. So, rheumatic heart disease in pregnancy is a persisting cause of morbidity and mortality, particularly in developing countries, and Australia also has a, has a number of people from other countries who come to us for medical care. Evaluation before pregnancy is a luxury, but it's much better because we can work out the risks, um, minimise these, discuss appropriate medication before. We need um, places with access to techniques that, such as um, valvuloplasty or surgery. We need to think carefully about the timing and mode of delivery, and this involves a whole range of teams. And we also need more prospective data, and Prof. Sullivan will talk to this later. Thank you.